Hey, Cypher here. I was born in San Luis Obispo, or simply slow, California, though I grew up in the Las Vegas Valley. I returned to get my masters at Cal Poly there and have written a bunch about local history. Suffice it to say, I love that place. And so, as part of the second Project Homecoming, I decided to split out a previous video about slow history. Project Homecoming is a big collaboration between history tubers talking about our different local histories. You can find the playlist linked below or right here. And since I'm so enmeshed in the local history there, I decided to have my father voice it, who was a historian in San Luis years before me, hence why I was born there. Hello, I'm Mark Hall Patton, and back in the late 80s and early 90s, I was the director of this museum that you see behind me. I also wrote for the local newspaper, I was involved with local history, I sat on the Cultural Heritage Committee, I worked with local preservation throughout the county. I was quite involved with all of local history here, with historic preservation throughout the county. This was what I did. The history of San Luis Obispo as a community is a fabulous one. It starts with the mission and moves forward from there. Chumash people lived in small villages throughout the San Luis Obispo area for centuries before the Spaniards came through. The first to enter the valley was in 1587 when a wayward Manila galleon made a small foray from Morro Bay. But the Spanish Empire did not conquer California until 1769. Seeing that Chumash were grateful when Spaniards hunted grizzly bears there, they created Mission San Luis Obispo de Tolosa in 1772 to take advantage and bring new converts called neophytes. Franciscan missionaries steadily converted locals and used their labor to build up the grounds, various agricultural ventures, and eventually ranching over the next half century. During the Mexican War of Independence, a missionary armed neophytes to defend against a pirate raid, which Alta California administrators worried about possibly causing an insurrection. After a Chumash revolt in modern-day Santa Barbara County, they started secularizing the missions. The Alta California government granted Mission San Luis Obispo's lands out to Mexican citizens to create vast domains beginning in 1837, including the mission itself eventually. Rancheros used secularized Chumash as vaqueros to man their ranchos, which they operated like lords of their own little fiefdoms. A small town grew around the old mission to facilitate local commerce and rudimentary governance. When the Bear Flaggers came through in 1846 while they were taking California for the United States, John C. Fremont gathered a few people for execution for violating their paroles earlier in the war. Local women led by Ramona Maria Carrillo y Pacheco de Wilson threw a peremptive funeral procession to gain the prisoner's mercy. Her husband owned the mission and became a leading figure in the massive changes to come in the next decade in American California. The subsequent gold rush brought a massive influx of population to California. Rancheros could sell their beef to miners and make a tidy profit, but the time became known as the Bloody Fifties. The county gained a reputation for gruesome violence, earning the fearsome moniker of El Barrio del Tigre, or Tiger Town. While the town grew, it did at a terrible cost with rising crime. San Luis Obispo's core leadership ensconced their power through vigilantism to keep the problem down, lynching numerous people in the process. Just as the gold rush wound down, climate disasters afflicted the state. First came massive flooding in 1862, and then a whole year without rain after that. This drowned and parched the soil, leaving it almost without grass, and therefore killing off most of the herds. As one historian wrote, from this result and the effect of breaking up the large ranchos, some have said that the great drought was a blessing, but it was a blessing of a revolution, which crushes and destroys one class so that another or more numerous one may rise in its stead. 
Indeed, the ranchos were parceled out to make some money, allowing for more growth in town outward into the open lands. Many ranchos were converted to dairy operations, which became the main product of San Luis Obispo for some time to come. The county had more substantial piers built in the 1870s, ending San Luis Obispo's isolation, and in the 1890s, the Southern Pacific Railroad came through town. In 1903, oil extraction began, bringing another boom to commerce and growing the town. When that boom subsided, county agriculture shifted to fruit growing as well, which led it to eventually having more strawberries grown here than anywhere else in the nation. You can see that at the farmer's market every Thursday, along with the local barbecue style with the unique tri-tip cut that came from the ranchero days. Starting in the 1960s, the wine industry flourished as well, with the Edna Valley and Pass Robles area becoming well-venerated appellations. To take advantage of this growing prosperity, Cal Poly was established in 1901. It started as a small polytechnic school, but eventually became a major university in the CSU system. For years, the biggest event in town was a science fair at Cal Poly called Poly Royal. It was quite the party scene, but in 1990 it got out of hand, leading to a citywide riot. No more Poly Royal after that, but San Luis Obispo remains a happening place, even having the police crash a Mardi Gras party as though it was a riot in 2004. The town has been through many changes. SLO is a wonderful place. If you want to see how that history fits into a larger conversation about what counts as historical, you can check out the original episode. But if you want to learn more about other history tubers' hometowns, the Project Homecoming playlist is linked below. See you next time. SLO is a wonderful place. <coughs> 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 Hi there. You're gonna do this the entire time? <laughs> Unless somebody wanted to be pet.